that's the sign of, of, of a great scientist yes, and intellectual when you're more pleased to learn that you were wrong than, than <laughs> you were right. Yes. Because if you were right, you didn't learn anything. If you were wrong, now you learn something. Absolutely. There, there, is something, there is something wonderful about being shown you're wrong. That's quite true. <laughs> but you've got to have be man enough or woman enough to be able to face up to it. <laughs> right. Welcome to Closer to Truth. I am speaking with Sir Roger Penrose on mathematics and world reflections. Roger is a distinguished pure mathematician, mathematical physicist, and Nobel laureate in physics. The emeritus Rouse Ball Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford, Penrose has distinct views on the philosophy of science, physics, cosmology, and mind, which we will explore. Closer to Truth is pleased to present this three-part mini-series with Sir Roger Penrose. This is part one, Penrose's approach to mathematics and his unique reflections on the deep nature of reality. Roger, it's great to see you again. Welcome. My pleasure. Let's start with your grand metaphysical framework, your three worlds, three mysteries, the physical world, the mental world, the platonic or mathematical world, each connected to the other two in your famous diagram of, of an equilateral triangle. What's the origin of, of this vision of yours of foundational reality? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, the picture, of course, was influenced by that particular um, an impossible triangle, which which was deliberate in a way, because in the picture you see a the, the mathematical mathematical world at the top, which I regard as having its own existence independently of us, and so on, and a, a very small part of that has to do with the physics of, of, of the physical world. We know when, when we get our physics, the mathematics of our physics right, it's very very precise. Of course, we're never quite right, but it's very, very precise. Um, however, it's only a very small part of the mathematical world which governs the operation of the physical world. So I represent this with this sort of beam coming down and physical world being encompassed in this very tiny part of the mathematical world. Then in the physical world, we have these conscious beings, and these conscious beings um, a, part, a very small part of the physical world. So it's a very tiny part of that world, which somehow the, the mental world is, is part of the facilities of the, of the conscious beings in the, in the physical world. So it's a very small part of the physical world, which seems to have direct relationship to consciousness. And I regard this consciousness as having a, a different kind of existence, but it springs from that very tiny part of the physical world. But that in the world of conscious experience, we also have understanding and we have understanding of mathematics. That, again, is a very tiny part of, of mentality. But nevertheless, that tiny part of mentality is part of it. And that is the understanding of mathematics. And so that, in a sense, encompasses, or at least has the potential to encompass the top world, which is the mathematical world. And I sort of draw this as a kind of paradox because it's a small part of each world which seems to encompass the totality of the next one. And it's deliberately drawn as paradoxical just to emphasize the strangeness of the whole thing, I think. I, I think we would all agree with the, the strangeness. Uh, it, it, it does the ontological reality of the mathematical world, what you have on top, um, privilege that, or ha have a, a higher position in the hierarchy of ontological beings than the other two? That's an intriguing question. You might say, why did I put it at the top? And it is deliberately at the top. Whether I got, regard it as somehow superior to the others, I don't know. I never quite thought of it that way. But it has a more existence in itself, I suppose. It has to be there. One could imagine that the physical world wasn't there. I mean, well, philosophers argue about that sort of thing, but at least one can imagine that the physical mm -hmm. world wasn't there. One could imagine that consciousness wasn't present at all. Sure. But to say that mathematics isn't there is somehow almost a contradiction. It, it conjures itself into existence in a certain sense. So perhaps that's my best answer to your question. Mm. 
Now, many scientists, uh, your colleagues, my colleagues, reject the ontological reality of both the mental and the platonic worlds. They say the mental is entirely derivative on the physical or supervenes on the physical, and the platonic world is just either a fictionalist view or uh, derivative from human language with, uh, with no substance in, in, in reality. Uh, I assume you've had conversations along those lines. What are, what are your responses to that? Yes, well, I don't know. I suppose my mental world, in a sense, is a, is a concession to those people, a different set of people who regard everything as mentality. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I'm not going to take a view, really, to say um, that anything is more real than another there. I'm just presenting the picture and the interrelationships between the different worlds and to say, I mean, I've been slightly talked into saying that the mathematical world is more fundamental, which in a certain sense I do think, because it has to be there, even if the other two didn't exist in that sense. Um, however, the mental world, I'm not really saying it's got a more powerful kind of existence than any of the others. I just think mentality has some kind of existence and to say it supervenes i don't know quite what, what that means exactly um well I mean, the, the, the idea is that the mental could not exist without the physical um I, where i don't people quite, who, yes sorry no, i don't quite no, see why the mental world needn't needs to i mean it might be that just one had mentality and it's not the world we live in that we might imagine having having just mentality and having no relationship to physics or mathematics. I, I can conceive of that view. It's certainly not my view. Um, so I don't quite see why there is this more greater objection to the mental world from some quarters anyway than, than the physical world. seems to me one can argue a case for any one of them to have an existence. It's not... I think one has to be careful about what my view is rather than just the view which I'm presenting here as mentality. I think it's very important to distinguish views that you present and your own personal views. I think sometimes they uh, kind of allied together as people yes. would would view it because you're so good at presenting different points of view. People think that everything you present is your view and that's not necessarily the case. You see, my view may not be all that clear. I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> honest, an honest man. <laughs> But I would regard mentality of having some kind of existence. And to say that it uh, supervenes, or whatever the word is, on, on the physical world is rather the presumption that we know what in the physical world produces mentality, which is a bit of a stronger statement than I'm making. Um, I don't claim to know that. I have some ideas about it. But why do we say that mentality sort of comes about just because of the physical world being there? Doesn't seem to me there's any argument there. We need we need some argument to say what it is that's about, which needn't be there. You could imagine a physical world in which there were thus there wasn't any mentality. People say, well, it comes from the physical world. Well, maybe it does, but we have to know in what way, what kind of physics produces mentality. I think there is this view, a sort of computationalist view, that when things get very complicated, uh, <laughs> then somehow mentality swoops into, 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 into existence. I don't see that at all. And then, as you, as you alluded, there are uh, really an increasing number of people who uh, would put um, a consciousness or mentality as uh, primitive uh, it, it, in whole uh, idealism or mm -hmm. in part uh, panpsychism. Uh, where yes. mentality has fundamental existence. And that's not your claim. Your claim is just a visual representation of these three worlds that exist in some yes. relationship to each other to present that as a, a fundamental fact of the world, how people interpret it is their business. I think that's right. That, that is, is, is the way I'm thinking about it, yes. <laughs> Let's trace the arc of your intellectual and scientific history, because it's been a, a remarkable um, uh, intellectual development that you, you've had. I'd, I'd just like to get your flow of, of, your, uh, of your own developmental process. You started in pure mathematics, algebraic geometry, right? Yes. What was the kind of work that you did in general terms? And, 
And then how did you begin moving out of that or, or expanding that? Well, I worked on a particular problem that was suggested by William Hodge, who was my supervisor initially. And uh, he suggested various problems. And the only one I could properly understand was what I thought about. And I started thinking about this problem in a way which was different, I think, from the way that most people were thinking about these things. And I came to a conclusion which I hadn't realized at the time that Hodge didn't believe me <laughs> because I'd said that a certain thing is impossible, that he, he suggests you, you find a formula. I'd have to explain what an algebraic variety is, and I won't, don't want to go into that really, but you have algebraic spaces and they can have different dimensions and you can have one space intersecting another one and you have a way of representing this space, which is thing called its Cayley form, which the intersection will have another Cayley form. And how do you write down the intersection in terms of the two Cayley forms, the two ingredients which intersect? And I was able to show that the most direct kind of expression that you would have to have for this in general didn't exist. Um, you had to do it in a way which was more arbitrary looking and complicated. And I, I told Hodge this at one time and he, I didn't realize he didn't believe me until in my third year when I, my supervisor then was John Todd instead. And uh, I remember Hodge working out a very simple example of this and the expression on his face I'd never seen. He was, he was actually delighted, which is which I give him. But he says, you were right all the time. Well, <laughs> hence I didn't realize that he, that he thought I'd made a mistake or something. <laughs> Quite curious. <laughs> But he, he seemed to be very pleased that I was right all the time, which I, which, which I find quite refreshing. <laughs> that, that's, that's the sign of, of, of a great scientist yes, and intellectual, yeah. when you're more pleased to learn that you were wrong than, than you were right. <laughs> yes. Because if you were right, you didn't learn anything. If you were wrong, now you learn something. Absolutely. No, there, was something there was something wonderful about being shown you're wrong. That's quite true. <laughs> But you've got to have to be man enough or woman enough to be able to face up to it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. We talked about the impossible uh, Penrose Triangle, uh, which uh, really opens up a, another area of your life in terms of visual representations of remarkable things. Penrose tiling, really new ways of of, thing, uh, of seeing visual representation of very fundamental uh, uh, geometric and algebraic transformations and things. But what I wanted to ask you is, as you develop that, you had this interaction with the artist M.C. Escher, which, which yielded some very famous work that he did. What's the real story behind that? I've seen a lot of different versions. <laughs> well, the real story was that I think it was my second year as a graduate student in Cambridge. And the International Congress of Mathematicians was being held in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I and a friend of mine decided we would go to the International Congress. And uh, I remember going to this and being very um, puzzled by many of the lectures, which I barely understood. <laughs> and, but one of, the, one of my lecturers, that was Sean Wiley, I remember I was getting on a tram and he was just getting off and he had in his hand this catalog. And I said, what on earth is that? It had a picture of Escher's night and day with the birds flying one way and the other way. And, uh, and I was absolutely stunned by that. And he said, You'd be, I'm sure you'd be interested. There is this exhibition of, in the Van Gogh Museum uh, by this artist, M.C. Escher. So I went to this exhibition. I was completely bowled over by it. <clears throat> and uh, I went away thinking that uh, I would like to do something impossible myself. I remember being struck by his one called Relativity, I think, where gravity we, is in three different directions and you have people walking upstairs in different ways quite incredible picture. And I came away thinking, let me try and do something impossible, which I hadn't quite seen in the exhibition. And this, I was thinking of roads and rivers and bridges, which went off and did impossible things. And I simplified it down to this, what people call a tri-bar, which was this thing, three rods at right angles like this. And, and it's impossible, but you could draw a picture of it nevertheless. And uh, I showed my father, and he got very taken up with these things. He was a very good artist, I should say, my father. And his father was, in fact, a professional artist. So I have, uh, I have uh, that on uh, inheritance, I suppose. But he, he was a very good artist himself. 
and occasionally we would go sketching together and that sort of thing. But he picked up on this and started to draw impossible buildings and things like this, and then came around with the staircase, which goes round and round and round. We then sent, a, we, we wrote an article, but we didn't know which journal to send it to. And my father said, well, he said, I happen to know the editor of the British Journal of Psychology, and I'm sure he would accept the paper, so let's say it's psychology. <laughs> so we <laughs> sent it to the journal, and indeed we got accepted. We gave some uh, reference to Escher in, in the uh, references, and we then sent a copy to Escher, uh, I think through a colleague, uh, uh, a Dutch colleague of my father's, and then my father had a bit of a correspondence with Escher, and I met him when I was traveling uh, with my then wife in, in the Netherlands, and I knew where he lived, and when I got reasonably close, I phoned him up. I had the phone number from, from my father, and uh, he, Escher, very generously suggested we come around for tea. And I remember sitting at this very long table. He was one end of the table and I was at the other end. And he had two piles of prints on one side, his, his left-hand side. He had this pile and he said, well, look, I, I don't have many of these left. But this other pile, and he pushed it all over to me, he said, choose one. <laughs> so I went through these things. It was a really difficult task. There were so many of them were fantastic. And I did pick one out, which he was very pleased. He said, most people don't appreciate that one. <laughs> so I was quite pleased with that. This was fish in scales. This one was a, there's a fish. You can see the big fish on the right top right hand. And then its scales become a lot of little fish. And then those little fish become bigger and bigger as you go around. And then one of those fish, its scales become little fish and they get bigger and bigger and one of them becomes the original fish so you have this kind of paradox of a set being a member of a set being a member of itself that sort of thing which was a, a the sort of aspect to that I think he appreciated but then I did have a, a he, he, he gave a print to my father on the, he, he produces the one with the monks going around with the uh, ascending and descending and my father had a copy of that directly from Escher. And um, I inherited that from my father when he died. And I ended up with several Eschers from different sources. But uh, the interplay with Escher was partly, I, yes, when I saw him, I gave him a set of puzzle pieces, which he um, then assembled. But he didn't quite know the principle on which they were designed. And so... I was a very bad correspondent. It took me ages to get to write letters, but I did. I to told him the principle it was designed on, and the last print he ever made was based on this principle. Wow. Wow. Roger, what then triggered your interest in astrophysics? Uh, quite a change from pure mathematics. Yes. Well, all these things have several origins. I think one of them was when I was in my, I think, my final year. <clears throat> at University College London, where I did my undergraduate work and in mathematics. And uh, I heard a, lecture, a series of lectures by Fred Hoyle, where he talked, I think there were five lectures or so, starting with the Earth and then the solar system and then the galaxy and so on, working its way out. And in the last talk, he described his version of what was referred to as the steady state model. At that time, there was a great puzzle because the universe appeared to be younger than some of its contents. There were these collections of stars called globular clusters, and they were calculated to have existed for longer than the universe seemed to have existed for, which was a paradox. There was actually a mistake because of a confusion between two, two different kinds of variable stars and they had got confused with each other. And that, so that was a mistake of that sort. But that wasn't known at the time. And the steady state model was evolved to, to, to encompass it. You say, well, you have, the universe doesn't have its origin of the Big Bang, but it went on continuously. And Fred Hoyle was a big proponent of this model. But anyway, I went to Cambridge to visit my brother Oliver, whom, from whom I did learn quite a bit of physics, I may say. Uh, I learned a lot of mathematics from my father, mainly, and, and other things, but physics partly from my brother. 
But anyway, I went to, to uh, Cambridge and I had lunch with Oliver, my brother, in the Kingswood restaurant. And I mentioned the, the problem I had with this picture that Fred Hoyle had described, right? The galaxies. He said they would go f further and further away, getting faster and faster and faster. And when they exceeded the speed of light, they would disappear from view. And I drew sort of little diagrams of light cones and things, and I didn't see how this could happen. I thought they would fade away, not disappear. They would just gradually fade away. And so I asked my brother, what's wrong with that? And why I don't think I quite agree with Fred Hoyle. And he said, well, I don't know anything about cosmology, but sitting on the table over there is my friend Dennis Sharma, and he yeah. will get, tell you the answer. So, so I described my thing to Dennis, and he said that he hadn't seen this way of reasoning before. And he said, well, I'll ask Fred about that. I didn't hear anything more until I went to Cambridge as a graduate school student. And then I went to Cambridge as a graduate student in pure mathematics. And Dennis sort of made a special beeline for me. And he decided he wanted to teach me cosmology. And <laughs> he, he was impressed enough by the thing that I'd shown him in the Kingswood restaurant to think that I ought to be converted to cosmology. <laughs> it was extremely useful to me. He used to go, in particular, driving at great speed. To, he wanted to go to Stratford and see the, the Shakespeare plays and things like that. So I accompanied him. It was, it was great fun. I had great long conversations with him on physics and things like that. And he used to drive around these roads at great speed and you'd be thrown to the side of the car and he would point to this upwards to the stars and he says that's the action of the fixed stars you see taking the blame away from his rather dangerous driving and uh, mm -hmm. uh, this was his view of Marx's principle that the inertia is determined by the fixed stars and so we had lots of very fundamental discussions of what would happen if you move the stars one by one and then you take the car apart particle by particle what happens to the inertia and so on and I started thinking about questions of that sort so I had this way into physics through my acquaintance with Dennis. But apart, quite apart from that, I had three different. You see, I thought three years, that's an awful long time to do my research. I can do go to lectures about things which have nothing to do with my topics. So what I did is I went to three courses, none of them anything to do with what I was thinking about, my, what my genuine research topic was. One was a talk by Bondi, Herman Bondi, on general relativity, a beautiful course, very good talk on a uh, series of talks on general relativity. One was a talk by Paul Dirac, the great quantum physicist on quantum mechanics, beautiful in a different way. I thought they were wonderful talks. The third was by a man called Steen, who was a mathematical logician. And I learned about Gödel's theorem, Turing machines, uh, computability, and all these ideas. And I formed from the talk, Steve's lectures, the view that I held ever since, that there is something very strange. You see, he described Gödel's theorem in a way which was quite different from the way that I'd thought. I thought it showed that there were things in mathematics that you couldn't prove. And I didn't like that idea very much, so I went and heard what, you, what it really says. And what it really says that if you have a certain methods of proof, which you lay down ahead of time, and if you trust those methods of proof as genuinely giving truths, that is to say, if the statement that you're using these methods to prove actually are proved by these methods, then it is true. If you believe that, then you believe in the truth of the Gödel statement. And I found that amazing. It tells you that your understanding of the rules and why they only give you truths transcends the use of those rules. How can we transcend those rules? I mean, if we operate according to an algorithm in some sort in our brains, which I suppose I thought that up to that point, how is it that we somehow can always transcend those rules if we understand them? Well, there's little catches to all that, but, but it was a view which I held at that point from those lectures that whatever mathematical understanding is, and that's part of understanding, whatever understanding is, in a more general way of saying it, um, whatever that is, it is not computational. It's not, we aren't Turing machines. And so I formed that view then, 
I thought we, I was also a physicalist in the sense that whatever's going on in our heads is, is where our brains are made of the same material as this computer, that microphone, and so on. It's just assembled in a different way. Sure, it's the same physics, but it's a part of that physics which is not being used in computational systems. And we don't know what that part is. And so is it part of Newtonian mechanics? I don't see it. Is it part of general relativity? I don't see it. Is it part of the Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics? I don't see it. But then I went back to the first lecture I heard of Dirac's and where he talked about his piece of chalk and how, why somehow, you see, there's a story I usually tell, which is a true story, but he was talking about the superposition principle. And he talked about a particle could be here or it could be here. And in quantum mechanics, you can have states where it's here and here at the same time. And that's a perfectly good quantum state. What about a macroscopic, macroscopic body like a piece of chalk? And I'm told, or I didn't re quite remember it particularly, that he'd broken it in two and he imagined this piece of chalk was in two places at once. At that time, my mind was wandering. I was looking out of the window for some reason, thinking about something completely different. And when my mind came back to the topic in hand, he'd moved ahead to the next topic. So I never heard what the explanation was for why a piece of talk short couldn't be in two places at once. So I've been worrying about that ever since. <laughs> yes, I put these things together in some way, that there is some mystery about which is missing from current quantum mechanics. And so all these other parts of the physics that I learned you could, in principle, put on a computer, at least to a sufficient accuracy. There is a question about what does sufficient accuracy mean, and things like that. So it's not quite straightforward. But more or less, the view was that there's something missing from our current understanding of physics, which is what conscious beings take advantage of. Mm. And it was... And well, I, I don't know whether I believed it was the collapse of the wave function at that time, or whether I, I think I probably did, but whether I believed it was gravity at that time is another question. The combining mm. of gravity with quantum mechanics is where you must have some, the new physics comes in, which is not computational. So Roger, what I hear is in your early days as a young, pure mathematician, suddenly you go to these lectures and you see astrophysics and you see quantum mechanics and in perhaps a new way and then consciousness emerging into it. So out of that early time kind of uh, was the breeding ground of your unique views in, in each of these areas and in cosmology, in the nature of fundamentals of quantum mechanics and in the nature of, of consciousness being non-algorithmic and non-computational and needing new physics to explain it all. All of this had an origin back at that same time that took then decades and decades to mature. Yes, that's completely true. I would say that Dennis Sharma in particular was a very important influence because he knew pretty well everything going on in physics and pretty well everybody. And he was very good at getting people to meet other people. If he thought it was important for person A to meet person B, he would go out of his way to, to arrange it. And he, he taught me an awful lot of physics. I think I would say that was as important as these lectures in, in driving where I went from there on. Mm. Now, you've said that you, uh, to look at the big questions of reality, you've said that you are personally not a religious believer, you don't believe in established religions of any kind, but you also say that maybe the universe has a purpose, that it's not all here by chance. Uh, which is not necessarily a popular view among many <laughs> scientists who are who are physicalists who would reject religion, but they would reject that there's any purpose in the physical universe. I think that form of words came from, I think it was Robert Forward, was it? He was interviewing a lot of astrophysicists and people, and that was a question that he raised. I'm not sure I'd have think I had thought of, I would have thought of raising it myself in that form. I, but in a sense, yes, I think there is something more to the existence of consciousness in the world. It's a difficult question. You see, I don't think that consciousness somehow conjures the world into existence. That's certainly not the, the view I hold. 
but in in another sense, the world's being what we call a world somehow depends on the potentiality for conscious beings to come into existence. It's a vague view, and I don't really know quite what to put any meat onto the onto the bones of that view. It's uh, it's not something that I would I, I have a very clear view on. Um, well, it is it is a view that many scientists have a clear view on that that is not possible that the physical world is all there is and like it or not it's um, it, it has no meaning no purpose it just it just is. It depends um, what you mean by the physical world. You see, the physical world does that encom- encompass the mental world, which I think most physicalists of that sort would tend to have a sort of view that it comes about with computation. They would tend to be computationalists. So you would say yeah. that if, if enough computation takes place, in some maybe even in some form, I'm not sure they would regard current computers as being conscious in any way. I don't know. That's a, that's a, You'd have to ask them. But um, some sense they would take it, take it sort of comes about. Not very interestingly in a sense, but it comes about when you have enough complicated enough calculations going on. That's not really my view, as, as I've just been saying. There's something else going on, quite different from that. Um, whether it gives a purpose or not is, is, a, is a slightly different kind of question. Well, to, to say that there's something else going on, that simple phrase is, to me, extraordinarily powerful. So thank you very much, yeah. Roger. Uh, <laughs> next, part two of Closer to Truth's three-part interview with Sir Roger Penrose. We will discuss his approach to physics, cosmology, and black holes, for which he won the Nobel Prize. You can watch more than 20 of Roger's videos on closertotruth.com and Closer to Truth's YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.